I'll read you a little history about the Dung Hung Caves. During the late 19th century and early 20th century, Western explorers began to show interest in the ancient Silk Road and the lost cities of Central Asia. And those who passed through Dung Hung noted the murals, sculptures, and artifacts, such as the Stale of Sulamian at Mogao. This is an estimated half a million square feet of religious wall murals within the caves. The biggest discovery, however, came from the Chinese Taoist named Wang Yunlu, who had appointed himself guardian of some of these temples around the turn of the century and tried to raise funds to repair the statues. Some of the caves had been blocked by sand, and Wang set out clearing away the sand and made an attempt at restoration of the site. In one such cave, on June 25, 1900, Wang followed the drift of smoke from a cigarette and discovered a walled-up area behind one side of a corridor leading to a main cave. Behind the wall was a small cave stuffed with an enormous hoard of manuscripts. In the text, excuse me, in the next few years, Wang took some manuscripts to show various officials who expressed varying level of interest. But in 1904, Wang resealed the cave following an order by the governor of Gongsu, concerned about the cost of transporting these documents. Words of Wang's discovery drew the attention of a joint British and Indian group led by a Hungarian-born British archaeologist, Arl Stein, who was an archaeological expedition in the area of 1907. Uh, he was on an archaeological expedition in the area in 1907. Stein negotiated with Wang to allow him to remove a significant number of manuscripts as well as the finest paintings and textiles in exchange for a donation to Wang's restoration effort. He was followed by a French expedition under Paul Pelliot, who acquired many thousands of items in 1908, and then by a Japanese expedition under Utani Kazu in 1911, and a Russian expedition under Sergei F. Oldenburg in 1914. A well-known scholar, Lo Shenyu edited some of the manuscripts Peliot acquired into a volume, which was then published in 1909 as Manuscripts of the Dunhong Caves. Stein and Peliot provoked much interest in the West about the Dunhong Caves. Scholars in Beijing, after seeing samples of the documents in Peliot's possession, became aware of their value. Concerned that the remaining manuscripts might be lost, Lao Shen Yu and others persuaded the Ministry of Education to recover the rest of the manuscripts to be sent to Peking, Beijing, in 1910. However, not all the remaining manuscripts were taken to Peking, and those retrieved, some were then stolen. And of those retrieved, some were then stolen. Rumors of catches of documents taken up by local people continued for some time, and a cache of documents hidden by Wang from the authorities was later found in the 1940s. Some of the caves were damaged and vandalized by white Russian soldiers when they were used by the local authority in 1921 to house Russian soldiers fleeing the Civil War following the Russian Revolution. And here, white, Rus uh, white Russian soldiers was a white, the white movement, also known as the Whites. Uh, so that was an anti-communist force that fought um, against the Bolsheviks, okay? So in 1939, Kuomintang soldiers stationed in Donghong caused some damage to the murals and statues at the site. The situation improved in 1941 when, following a visit by Wu Sorin, to the site the previous year, the painter Shang De Quien arrived at the caves with a small team of assistants and stayed for two and a half years to repair and copy the murals. 
He exhibited and published the copies of the murals in 1943, which helped to publicize and give much prominence to the art of Dung Hong within China. Historian Xiang Da then persuaded Yu Yuren, a prominent member of the Kuomintang Chinese National Party, to set up an institution, the Research Institute of Dung Hong Art, which later became the Dung Hong Academy at Mogao in 1944 to look after the site and its contents. In 56, first premier of People's Republic of China, Xiao Enlea, took a personal interest in the caves and sanctioned a grant to repair and protect the site. Okay, so this just goes through some of the preservation eff efforts. Um, so I wanna get to where they're at today. Today, efforts are continuing to conserve and research the site and its content. The Malgong Caves became one of UNESCO's World Heritage Sites in 1987. From 88 to 95, a further 248 caves were discovered to the north of the 487 caves known since the early 1900s. So, wow, that's pretty recent, right? 248 caves were discovered in the in the past kind of uh, 40 years. The Dung Hung Academy entered a period of scientific conservation for the Malgong Caves in the 1980s and began exploring digital conservation as early as 93. Since 2010, it has completed photographic acquisition of 120 caves, image processing of 40 caves, panoramic roaming of 120 caves, and 3D reconstruction of 20 painted sculptures in the Malgong Caves. The Dunhong Academy also introduced IM Cave, a multi-touch desktop system for virtual tours of the Mogol Caves, which presents a relationship between currently damaged artifacts and their virtual restored versions that cannot be experienced during a real tour. Wow, that sounds interesting, right, everybody? Uh, looks like you can actually take a tour of these caves. And of course, it's... um. Let's get into some of the content, if we can, here. So the manuscripts from, and we, we can uh, kind of share this with the YouTube audience under the name, uh, the Dong Hong Manuscripts, if you, if you want to. Uh, so a lot of folks are very interested in the historic aspect of the Dharma. So the manuscripts from the library cave date from 5th century until early 11th century when it was sealed. Can you believe that? 5th century, that's very early for preserved documents. Uh, you gotta think, the first poly canon for the Theravada tradition started springing up around 14th, 15th century. Uh, the earliest fragments of poly in general were discovered only around the 4th century. So here we have actual manuscripts from that early on is pretty remarkable. So uh, up to 50,000 manuscripts may have been kept there. One of the greatest treasure troves of ancient documents found. And now let's pause for a second. Let's ask ourselves, why would there be 50,000 manuscripts of all these different religions going on? It's again, this theme of persecution, anything that sets the people free. Uh, the the governance or the empires or the you know sometimes it's the the ruling monarchs they for some reason it's almost extraterrestrial the way systematically for thousands of years true inner yoga has been persecuted you know I know I'm getting a little creative with my thinking but the way it's systematic and continuous is wild. But why would they have to stash all these documents? Because of persecution. Because people love to burn libraries. They still do, actually, right? They still love to re-educate the natives, uh, burn all their traditions, burn all their religions. This is a terrible trend. But thankfully, there's no stopping the Dharma. We get discoveries like this, where just in the 80s and 90s, uh, more caves were discovered. It's fascinating. So let's get into this a little. I know I was going to read from the actual, some of the texts that were discovered at Dunghung, 
but let's get keep getting into the background here i think for some of you it may be uh totally interesting to to correlate that you know you have access to these zokchen 70 texts that were discovered in dongo it's it's pretty wild so more on the background here up to 50,000 manuscripts have been kept there. yeah while most of them are in Chinese, a large number of documents are in various other languages, such as Tibetan, Uyghur, uh, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, uh, Uyghur, I think it is. Yeah, that's, um, that's old uh, Uyghur al alphabet. It's a, a Turkic script used for writing, mm -hmm. old Uyghur variety of old Turkic spoken in Turpan and Gansu that is the ancestor of modern Western Uyghur language. Okay, very interesting. So other languages such as uh, Tibetan, Uyghur, Sanskrit, and Sogdian. Sogdian language is an e Eastern Iranian language spoken mainly in the Central Asian region of Sogdia, located in modern day uh, Uzbekistan, Pakistan, Kazakhstan, and Krag, uh, Kragistan. Wow, very interesting, huh? It was also spoken by some Sogdian immigrant communities in ancient China. Okay, including, and then also the language of Kutanese, by the way, uh, from the uh, Tarim Basin there, where we find this desert that can preserve thousands of year old shamans and things that have been found there, right so the kings of, by the way the the buddhist kingdoms of kotan and kushta are very interesting to research they still to this day talk about mahayana being there and stories of buddha shakyamuni traveling there and all kinds of others uh, they had ancient viharas there okay so also fascinating stuff so Saka or Sakyan was a variety of Eastern Iranian languages attested from the ancient Buddhist kingdoms of Khotan, uh, Kashgar, and looks like Tomshuk in the Tarim Basin, in what is now southern Zhejiang, China. It is a Middle Iranian language. So can you believe that? The Iranians are linked with Buddha Dharma. <laughs> okay. So many languages we have here, many, uh, it looks like somebody kind of emergency stashed a bunch of texts and maybe just added on. Maybe it was even a, a mountain library of some sorts, right? Uh, it could also have been like that, but it looks more like an emergency stash to me. Although uh, it could have been a little bit of both. It certainly was a place of practice, so it could have been a library. And then when possibly when persecution or threats started to arise, that would have been uh, the various gov governments at the time. Uh, they probably sealed it up, just like Wang sealed it up in the 19th century under threat. So it sounds like it's been sealed up multiple times, yeah? Uh, Sean sharing something there, persecution of the Sufis. Yeah. Oh, this is on the point of the persecution of inner yoga, right, Sean? There is, a, I mean, anybody interested in history, there is a wild systematic history of that. Uh, so let me just uh, continue a little bit here and get into what what we find in these texts. So. They may be old hemp paper scrolls in Chinese and many other languages. Uh, Tibetan looks like Pothis, which is a, a palm leaf manuscript, and paintings on hemp, silk, or paper. Interesting, too. They used hemp a lot. Uh, the subject matter of the great majority of the scrolls is Buddhist in nature, but it also covers a, a diverse material. It also covers a diverse material. Uh, hmm, okay. Along with the expected Buddhist canonical works are original commentaries 
apocryphal works, workbooks, books of prayers, Confucian works, Taoist works, Christian works, works from the Chinese government, administrative documents, anthologies, glossaries, dictionaries, and calligraphic exercises. Many of the manuscripts were previously unknown or thought lost. Ah, that's interesting, huh? And the manuscripts provide a unique insight into the religious and secular matters of northern China, as well as other Central Asian kingdoms from the early period up to the Tang and early Song dynasty. The manuscripts found in the library cave include the earliest dated printed book, the Diamond Sutra, from the year 868. Yeah, interesting uh, fact there that the Diamond Sutra was the earliest known book. Uh, the the Dharma the Dharma actually, if you include uh, some of the Vedas and things, is so ancient. So the Diamond Sutra was first translated from Sanskrit into Chinese in the fourth century. These scrolls also include manuscripts that range from the Christian Jingzhao documents. Oh, Jingzhao is very interesting. If you guys ever get a chance to look at that, that's the uh, uh, the religion of luminosity, and you see Jesus Christ in full lotus. That's something I've never seen anywhere else. Um, yeah, it's also known as the the Church of the East. Uh, hold on. They're called the Jesus Sutras, okay? They're, they're connected with 7th century mission in Alapa in the Church of uh, the East Bishop from Mesopotamia and an 8th century monk named Adam. <laughs> and these were first discovered in, in Dunghang, okay? But let me see here. Uh, go a little bit further into this. The Church of the East is a very interesting, uh, it looks like this is, Jing Zhao is uh, actually related to something else here. It was kind of like an amalgamation of Christianity and Buddhism, very wild, and I think even closer to to what we probably had going on in the very beginning, a uh, more holistic. But um, so anyway, uh, the scrolls also include manuscripts that range from the Christian Jing Zhao documents to the Donghang Go manual and ancient music scores, as well as the image of the Christian, oh, excuse me, the Chinese astronomy Donghang map. So this is actually the game Go. So it actually had the the Go manual. Uh, yeah, which you guys can research the, the historicity of that. <laughs> what an old game, right? So these scrolls chronicle the development of Buddhism in China, record the political and cultural life of the time, and provide documentation of mundane secular matters that gives a rare glimpse into the lives of ordinary people in these areas. The manuscripts were dispersed all over the world in the aftermath of the discovery. Stein's acquisition was split between Britain and India because his expedition was funded by both countries. Stein had the first pick, and he was able to collect around 7,000 complete manuscripts and 6,000 fragments for which he paid 130 pounds. Although these include many duplicate copies of the Diamond and Lotus Sutras, Piliot took. Oh, period. Yep. Well, I just want to mention there the the Diamond Sutra being dated to the the year the fourth century is very powerful evidence for Mahayana always having been there. Now it may have been elaborated on and uh, distorted, just like everything. But um, this is. We have basically earlier evidence for Mahayana than we do for uh, Shravakayana paths. So those people following the EBT tradition, the early Buddhist text tradition, I don't know. Uh, they must be stopping around the 15th century, which is not that early in my opinion. So anyway, 
Belia took almost 10,000 documents for the equivalent of 90 pounds. But unlike Stein, Pelliot was a trained sino, a sinologist, sinologist, literate in Chinese. <laughs> sino, just, yeah. He was allowed to examine the manuscripts freely, so he was able to pick a better selection. I don't care about all that. <laughs> all right, I was looking for more of a, like, a concisive list. But this obviously goes on and on and on. It's a huge article if you want to look up the Mogao Caves. It's M-O-G-A-O -O Caves. Uh, 16 Kingdoms, 7 Caves, the oldest dated to the Northern Liang period. Yeah, they, they go through all the different caves here. Very early on, 4th century, okay? That's very early. This place has been a Dharma hub for quite some time. Uh, there is an article on the Dunghong. Uh, okay, here we have a list, okay, that I found. So, non Buddhist religious texts, Taoist texts, including the Hao Hong Jing and the Shi'er commentary to the Tao Te Ching. The Jewish Siliot prayers, as well as a version of the Old Testament in Hebrew. Nestorian Christian text, uh, Manchian text. By the way, excuse my pronunciation. Some of these I'm still learning too. Um, so social documents such as contracts, account books, and loan receipts. Philosophy, notably the Confucian classics, including an ancient edition of Analects, commented by Hong Kong, an ancient edition of Shang Shu. Literature, including Chinese folk songs and classical poetry. History, both official and local. Geography, including the Wang Wu, Taiyan Shu, Gao Chang. Medicine, astronomy, including the Donghong star map. That sounds interesting. Is one of the uh, the star map is one of the first known graphical representations of stars from ancient Chinese astronomy dating to the Tang Dynasty. Uh, that'd be 618 to 907. So very cool, ancient star map. So it had mathematics, it had divination, including the Erk Bitig dictionaries, including fragments of the Kuo Yun, music scores and dance notations. Okay, so Afghan has Afghan uh, Geniza, a cache of age, ancient religious and secular documents. All right, and the Buddhist texts, by far, is the largest portion of, uh, of Buddhist texts, include sutras, commentaries, and treatises. I think they just haven't been translated yet or, or, or really uh, cataloged because it's not giving me a list of the Buddhist text, but it says here, um, much of the scholarship on Chinese Buddhist manuscripts has been on Chan, which have revolutionized the history of Chan Buddhism. Oh, among the Tibetan Buddhist manuscripts, the texts of early Tibetan Tantric Buddhism, including Maha Yoga and Ati Yoga or Dzogchen, have been the subject of many studies. Isn't that great that we have Dzogchen in there? What are the chances? That's so cool. 